Thank you. Watching in progress. So, welcome everybody. My name is Brian Lawler. I'm Professor of OLA Psychiatry and the Site Director for the Global Brain Health Institute based here at Trinity College Dublin. So you're very welcome to this exciting webinar on the next gen brain health. Um, in this webinar, we will address key issues related to brain health in young adults. Now young adults are defined age-wise as between 18 and 39. And I've been reliably informed that I've just missed the age cutoff, but I'm still intensely interested in finding out about whether it's our mindset or our age that determines how we act, think and feel essentially our brain health. So up until now, most of the focus in brain health has been on tackling risk factors from midlife to later life. But this webinar will shine a light on the brain health needs and also the important and innovative contributions of the next generation to global brain health and dementia risk reduction. So we're very excited to have you tune in to what can become a new grassroots, grassroots movement for brain health for young adults across the world tackling the many issues that are so acutely relevant and meaningful to this generation's brain health, including planetary health, climate change, forced migration, to mention just a few. And importantly, you, the next generation brain health leaders, can make a really big difference. So next slide. So in terms of today's agenda, after the introductory remarks, we'll have Francesca Farina set the context. Then we're going to have a panel discussion led by Francesca and by Laura Bowie. I'll uh, have some reflections then at the end, and then Laura uh, will uh, give some thanks, announcements, and next steps. So next slide. So the goals of this webinar really are to understand how young adults conceptualize brain health and dementia uh, and dementia risk reduction, to understand the current state of knowledge surrounding brain health in young adults, and very importantly, to engage with the next generation research project. Next slide. Now, these two individuals don't need much introduction. Um, they're behind the concept and development of next gen brain health. That's Laura Bui, social gerontologist at Leeds Beckett University, and Francesca Farina, a neuroscientist based at Northwestern uh, University in the USA. So now uh, I'd like to hand over to Francesca who will set the context for next-gen brain health. So over to you, Francesca. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you to GBHI for hosting us and for giving us this opportunity. We are so excited to have this panel discussion and we have fantastic panelists for you today. Before I hand over to my colleague, Laura, I wanna give a little bit of context around young adult brain health and why we in the Next Gen Project think that young adulthood is such a key life stage to focus on for not just dementia prevention and risk reduction, but also brain health optimization. So I think there's still a tendency to think about dementia as a later life problem, but Really, we know from the literature, from the evidence that a lot of the changes, the brain changes that are occurring that underlie dementia start a lot earlier. So in recent years, there's been a shift in focus towards life course prevention and risk reduction. And I think many people on the call will be familiar with this graphic from the 2020 Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention that suggests that 40% of dementia cases are potentially preventable by addressing lifestyle risk factors. And more recently, there's been evidence to suggest that this figure could be even higher in minoritized groups, as high as 56% of cases. So if we look at these factors here, we see from midlife and later life, there are 11 factors that we could potentially target for dementia prevention and risk reduction. And if we look away at the top of the graph in green, we see one factor for early life, education. So in next gen, we've started to think about well, what is early life? And you saw Brian define that lovely for us earlier. In The Lancet, they say anything before 45. So this is a pretty big age bracket to think about. And if we take some of the examples that are highlighted here for later life stages, and we ask, well, are any of these factors relevant to young adults? Let's take hearing loss, which is the biggest risk factor that's mentioned for midlife. 
The World Health Organization estimates that 1 billion young adults are at risk of hearing loss due to unsafe listening practices and loud noise exposure. If we take another factor, traumatic brain injury, we know that young adults are in the biggest risk category for brain injury due to things like vehicle collisions, contact sports, and the lesser talked about intimate partner violence. Hypertension, another example, 22% of young adults in the US have high blood pressure, it's 15% in the UK. Alcohol use peaks in young adulthood, especially risky behaviors like binge drinking. If we look at some of the later life risk factors, depression peaks, the onset peaks at 20 years old. Social isolation, air pollution, again, who estimates that 99% of us are living in polluted environments with air quality um, beyond the recommended guidelines. So we know that young adults are already exposed to a lot of these risk factors by the time they reach young adulthood. And our work and work of others has shown that although young adults have this exposure, their awareness maybe is lower than what we would expect. So we know that awareness of these risk factors is kind of low to moderate. And when we think about it, that makes sense because in a way, because we don't put as much emphasis in schools and universities on brain health as we do things like physical health and mental health. And that's really what we're trying to tackle with the Next Gen project. Young adults are a great group to work with in terms of getting this message out there. And some of this work is already ongoing with the youth movement against Alzheimer's and groups like Hilarity for Charity. And really, I think we have an opportunity in brain health and dementia prevention because young adulthood is such a critical life stage when people are becoming independent they're really recognizing their values um, and they're making habits that will stick with them for the rest of their adult life the other great thing about young adults is they're also not afraid to get angry so as brian has already mentioned we've seen that young adults are now successfully suing governments organizations who they feel are not tackling the climate crisis or giving this the attention it deserves. This is just one article that I pulled from a couple of months ago. And again, we see this in our own data. When we talk to young adults, when we do focus group work, they say things to us about creating inclusive and accessible environments if we wanna optimize brain health. So I'm really excited about this conversation and I think we have massive opportunity, but it's up to us as a community to try to engage these groups. And now I'm really excited to hand over to my colleague, Laura, who's going to introduce you to our panel. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat as we go. We would love to make this as um, interactive as possible. Laura. That was great, Francesca. Thank you so much. My name is Laura Boy. So before we get into the, the discussion with individuals, we're just going to have some brief introductions with all four of our panelists. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce each of them. So we're going to start with Maritza Pinta Kaipa, um, who is a friend and a colleague. She's a neurologist from Peru who specializes in dementia and brain health. She works primarily in remote indigenous populations. She's also a Global Atlantic Fellow with the Brain Health Institute with Francesca and myself. Um, she also serves on the Global Advisory Board for the Atlantic Institute. She's well linked in with the global brain health community, working closely with the Brain Health Diplomacy Group with the Brain Health Institute, as well as leading data collection in the Amazon, looking at young adult perspectives of brain health in these remote populations. So may I please have the spotlight with Maritza? Ah, wonderful. Thank you for having, thank you for being here, Maritza. Great to see you. So I have one question for you. What are some of the unique opportunities and challenges of doing brain health research with remote and indigenous populations? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you everybody to be here and also for the invitation and thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you for this kind of work that you are leading seriously. I get it, I got excited from the beginning when you told me about the project because I grew up in a remote community in Peru, also as a neurology, as a general physician, I was working for a long time in rural communities outside the capital. So I was able to know deeply how this kind of population are living and which kind of thinkings are they are having around brain and brain health. Um, and that was the reason why I, 
I was able to apply for UBHI like three or four years ago when I was exposed to different of kind of reality when where people are uh, um, they are um, they have no knowledge about brain health or dementia or neurology. Many times it's hard for us um, to be there as a neurology, just talking about the brain because they have other kind of priorities like looking for food or money or trying to work every day to, to have something to survive. And so the brain or brain health of dementia could be like another kind of language, another kind of, of um, knowledge that they are um, many times um, uh, far away to understand. So from the beginning, we, we have many challenges uh, doing the questionnaire, for example, we have to be very careful in which kind of word and phrases, how we could we better uh, uh, ask in a best way, uh, trying to have the best answer for them. Also, now where I am working and, and traveling to these communities, the challenging is not just um, about knowledge or uh, in terms of education, it is also, there is uh, many kinds of gaps and barriers uh, according in terms of cultural barriers, um, lingua, language barriers, uh, and most of uh, um, this kind of language barriers is more remarkable in the Andes of the country. Um, also geographical barriers because uh, all these communities that I am working for uh, are far away from the capital. I have to uh, travel a lot. I love that. I am excited about that, um, but it is a little bit challenging many times. Um, but uh, it is good to know deeply these kind of communities to look for stakeholders, friends. Uh, new is a new community to explore. I'm happy doing this work and the, the data that we are collecting is completely important um, because from my knowledge, I already knew many this kind, uh, a lot of this data, but it is different when we are collecting uh, uh, using science, uh, this kind of experience uh, living in that uh, remote communities. So, yeah. And also the, the, the another good thing is to work in the, uh, kind of communities is that they are still, uh, for example, living in in beautiful places. Uh, many times, just uh, living uh, the life in a really uh, simple way could be good for the brain also. Um, but yeah, we need to do more uh, work to explore better that communities. Terrific. Thank you. I think it's really interesting and really important how you brought up that it, it they could be living in a different, more simple way, perhaps, and that might positively affect brain health, but we don't know. We haven't collected that information yet, so let's go do it. Yeah, of course. Terrific, terrific. Um, we'll come back. If there's any questions for Maritza, please put them in the chat, and then we'll get back to them after we introduce our next three speakers. All right, if I may have the spotlight on Michaela Davies, please. Um, Michaela, welcome. She's a Director of Communications and Knowledge Translation at the Center for Advanced Health Outcomes at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver in Canada with the Canadian Institute for Health Research with Canadian HIV Trials Network. She holds a master's degree in communications and has a wealth of experience working within healthcare and nonprofits and publicly traded companies. We don't, we just don't need to share the Zoom screen just yet. Sorry to interrupt your presentation, Kayla. I will, Michaela, I will get right back into it. Um, after years of being involved in brain health research as a science communicator, in May of 2021, Michaela was hit by a car while riding her bike and working and from work. And now she's experienced what it's like to live with a traumatic brain injury firsthand. So Michaela is one of our lived experience experts on the Next Gen program of research. Um, she's a terrific person, and I have one question for you. What has been your experience of working in the research sector and now participating as a lived experience expert as an individual living with a traumatic brain injury? Thanks, Laura. So uh, first, I'll acknowledge that I'm joining today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, where I am grateful to live and work. And um, 
It's a very good question. In my intro, it mentions I was hit by a car, but it's not entirely true. Uh, I was more hit by a piece of a car as someone opened their door into me while I was on a road bike. But uh, it sounds a lot less impactful to say I was just doored, uh, but there was quite an impact. And that's my TBI joke. Um, <laughs> as, uh, as there are so few, you get to tell. Um, so the accident happened and I went back to work a few days later and tried to function as normal. And during that first day back, luckily enough, I had a colleague who specialized in concussion research who, after one meeting with me, said, you've recently had a head trauma, haven't you? Um, which is never something you want to hear after you've given a presentation. But um, And I would have tried to push through it. I really would have had she not told me that I was going to make myself much worse and do permanent damage if I didn't take it seriously. Then, of course, I still tried to push through it. I have a career. I have kids. I don't get to sit in a dark room to recover without being literally forced into it, um, which I was eventually by my partner and loved ones, which I'm very grateful for. And during that time, I had a lot of a lot of chances to reflect, uh, mostly being unable to watch screens or distract myself with anything. And I did reflect a lot on my role in research. And we talk a lot about in the sector, and I talk a lot in, in my everyday life at work about nothing about me without me. And that's a really important concept. We can't ever forget that research doesn't have an ideal past when it comes to respecting the humanity of a participant, let alone appreciating and integrating a person's thoughts, values, and perspectives into the research itself. And in my own career in knowledge mobilization and science communications, I work with people with lived and living experience of various disease groups and conditions. And I don't come from a typical science stream. And I'm really thankful that I already have a head start in making sure protocols and consent forms are digestible and understandable for everyone, um, or as digestible as a 25-page document could be. Um, but one of the first things I thought of when I arrived home from the accident is I had to file an insurance report. And if I have to look at a screen, I felt I'm going to pass out. Um, but I had to do it. I had to fill out complex fields. I had to find my driver's license number. I had to recall what I was wearing, the colors of outfit that I was wearing, what the weather was, what direction the car was parked in. And trying to find those memories at the time was like, looking through thousands of file folders for one crumpled post-it note. And it just cognitively was incredibly difficult. And I thought this is not conducive to my recovery at all. Um, so the irony of injuring yourself further while trying to fill out forms to get treatment to help your injury uh, was not lost on me. And what stood out for me in this context is the importance of integrating people with lived experience into the creation of these processes. And that leads to, of course, obviously the importance of people with lived experience in your own research and letting an important concept as well in this is letting those folks with people, letting folks with lived experience lead the storytelling at their own pace, lead sort of their communication with researchers at their own pace. Because in the early stages of my TBI, I wasn't quite sure what my point was until I went through these relatively long narratives of hearing myself speak out loud. And I found that as well in my dealings in those early stages with the insurance companies is often they wanted one sentence answers and I could not get to those without communicating in a much longer way. So if possible for folks in the room who do work with patient partners, or if you haven't, if you're thinking about integrating community voices into your work, um, Take some time to get to know the people with lived experience who you're dealing with. Show a bit of your humanity. Uh, laugh at my jokes, even though they're not fantastic. It goes a really long way towards building that kind of non-judgmental environment and trust that you really need to maximize the benefit for both patient partners and your research. Um, also being open to new concepts and ideas that come from working with folks with lived experience, uh, bringing us in at the beginning. If you can, don't wait until you have ethics approval and the protocol is finalized. Use principles of integrated KT and bring us in early to ask those key questions because we could shape your research project in a different way that you were thinking. Um, and be okay if we challenge you. It, you might be surprised how much stronger your research is and you'll certainly have a stronger knowledge translation and knowledge mobilization plan with that early integrated feedback on who should be learning about research. And I see just a quick comment, KT, uh, question mark. I'm sorry, I should, yeah. Knowledge translation, 
Should I explain further, Laura, about what that no, is? That's, that's terrific. That's terrific. But we just um, want to be inclusive, Michaela. So if you could not, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yes, the communications person in me is just withering right now, as I often tell our investigators to, to never shorten terms like that. But um, I can't speak for all lived experience experts, but um, personally, I like to be seen as an active collaborator and not added to a publication in sort of a, a tokenizing way. Um, and it's not just checking a box for involvement. Um, if I'm suggesting something methodologically terrible, tell me about it. Um, perhaps I could make you a better researcher and you can make me a better collaborator in the long run because these projects are long-term investments. And if you aim to make meaningful change, you're bringing others along with you in a mentorship capacity. And collaboration is contagious, I always like to say, and the more you're open to working with others, the further your network grows and the more re uh, reach your work has. So um, I would have my communication sash taken away from me if I didn't do a quick summary of my key messages. Um, first, listen to the people with lived or living experience tell their story in the way that they want to, even if it deviates from the list of questions you have. Two, uh, show your humanity. This can be an intimidating process for a patient partner, especially one who's working through uh, something like I was. And try to relate to us, be more engaged, and we'll probably share more info that could be of help to you. And involve me early. I can help shape your research for the better. Lastly, uh, speak to your patient partners with uh, as equals. We're having a conversation, not an interview, and we're in it together to make better research overall. That's terrific. Michaela, thank you so much. I think you summed it up perfectly. I have nothing else to do um, other than what an interesting perspective of somebody who has the experience of research and then has a lived experience of something that we're now conducting research on. Um, okay, if there's any questions specifically for Michaela, Michaela, please put them in the chat. Um, and I'm going to move on to Simon. Thank you so much, Michaela. Now, Simon Long. Um, Simon Long is editor at large of The Economist, which is a magazine, which he joined in 1995. He had previously spent nine years with the BBC, which is the British Bod Broadcasting Corporation, for <laughs> those of us who are not in the UK. He's an analyst on East Asian affairs based in London as, and as a correspondent in Beijing and Hong Kong. He wrote extensively for The Guardian, another magazine, and many other outlets. He has written special reports on a wide range of subjects, and most recently, and the reason that we requested slash gently pressured him to be on this webinar today was because he just wrote the ADI World Alzheimer's Report 2023, which was launched last month. Simon, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have one question for you today. How do we get people, journalists, the public, media experts, interested in brain health as opposed to dementia? And then the follow-up question for that is, should we even? It's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, if you look at public health campaigns over the past 30, 40 years, dementia has hardly featured at all, right? I can think of it as being an issue when people talk about sports, uh, about, about the risk of playing rugby or American football or heading a, heading a soccer ball. Uh, but it, in, 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 our, in other ways, it, it's just, it's, it's barely there. And yet, uh, according to the Lancet Commission, the risk of um, developing dementia in, in the developed West has 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 fallen sharply by about twenty five percent over the past twenty years, uh, from so that a, a, a seventy five year old had a one in four chance of going on to develop dementia in uh, uh, nineteen ninety five and a uh, one in five chance in twenty fifteen. I mean, these are quite these are quite remarkable um, developments, but if it clearly had nothing to do with dementia awareness campaigns, and uh, and, and and so one wonders, you know, does it matter? Well, clearly it does. That there's a, there's, a, there's still an awful lot, as you were sh as uh, Francesca was showing in the Lancet Commission slide earlier on. There's still an awful lot more that can be done in the field of risk reduction. And the question, I suppose, is to what extent does it help to add dementia risk to it, and how should that dementia risk be be couched? Um, I, I know. Some people I spoke to in, in making this report were quite um, vehement in it, arguing that dementia ought to be out there front and center 
Um, Chris Van Tulliken, for example, who's this campaigner on uh, now TV doctor and campaigner on ultra processed foods. Uh, he he has the uh, had the phrase that well I think dementia will be very 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 incentivizing. I mean at the moment campaigns are directed at sort of things that are are themselves causes of dementia: high blood pressure, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, lack of exercise, uh, all all of these things, all of which. Uh, you know, you can you can improve through diet and exercise and help, and and there are campaigns around getting people to do that, uh, and that that has helped bring the risk of developing dementia down. But it, it's it does not in itself. So to go on to your your second question, uh, it, I think it would be um, uh, helpful to talk less about dementia and more about brain health. That that is a concept that that people are far less worried about. People still. Um, and, and rightly associate dementia with old age. They think it's something that they, they have a risk on uh, of developing a lot later in life. And just as some of these other risks that people go on to ignore for cancer or cardiovascular disease, that's that's a, a sort of secondary risk they can all, all the more easily ignore. But um, brain, brain health, I think, is something that is easier to, to communicate. It's something that relates to all ages. And when I was preparing this report, as I know, when we first met, I told you that, that I found that there was this big gap that you could see a lot being done for people later in life. And that there are, in, in a number of places now, programs in schools, but there's this big gap at this uh, the, this big risk period in in early early adulthood. So uh, yeah, yeah, in 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 in, in, um, in answer to your question, yes, I I, th I think it, I think it would help to start talking about 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 brain health, and and if I can say back to your point that that you and or Francesca made to me when we first met that hadn't occurred to me until then was that, um, and it, it, it struck me my 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 son is a twenty year old student sharing a house with five other students. And uh, of that of, the, of those six 19, 20 year olds, four have diagnoses of some sort of neurodiverse condition. People are, are this, and that's not unusual, right? It's, they, people are far more aware of brain health in its broadest sense. And in a way, bringing dementia into it as another brain health risk is, is it should, should not be that hard. I'll stop there. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, okay, wonderful. It's true. People are in the the young adult generation are primed to talk about neurodiversity and brain and brain uh, things that are happening with the brain. All right, I'm going to move on to Anna. So Anna Day, may I please have her spotlighted? She serves as a head of stakeholder engagement with the Women's Brain Project, who's heavily promoting this event and the Next Gen Project. So thank you very much. And is leading Women's Brain Project's policy and advocacy activities. She's passionate about global health policy and advocates projects that truly make a difference. And it's exactly what the Women's Brain Project aims to do is regarding women's health, precision medicine and care and brain mental health. She specializes in international healthcare public affairs and received both her undergrad and masters from London School of Economics. Anna, thank you so much for being here. We have one question for you before we get into the panel very shortly here, is how can we drive health policy change and advocate for young women's brain health? Um, thank you so much, Laura, for having me and um, inviting me on behalf of Women's Brain Project. It's a real pleasure to be with you all. And thank you so much for the thought provoking question, because it's made me think the last couple of days. Um, and certainly from a Women's Brain Project perspective, as you may know, um, brain conditions disproportionately affect women. So when we look, for instance, in particular in this case, um, Alzheimer's, two thirds of all Alzheimer patients are women, and it's not just because women live somewhat um, longer, but we also look at other brain conditions like migraine is um, three times more common in women as in compared to men, and migraine is also a risk factor for dementia, especially migraine with aura. And then you look at areas like anxiety and depression, and that's twice as likely to affect women um, as compared to uh, men. And that can also somewhat be um, a risk factor as well as highlighted in the Lancet Commission um, beautiful visual um, for dementia. 
And um, so we're exploring all these areas at Women's Brain Project. As you know, our focus is um, first and foremost precision medicine. So we do somewhat look at the slightly older <laughs> Um, age uh, age group, but we are very much committed to also looking at prevention and risk factors from a gender perspective. So whether that's um, early menopause, um, the hormonal aspects, and I saw an excellent question also raised in the chat um, just earlier. So we're looking into all these factors. We don't have all the um, all the answers to these questions, but we're aware of the questions. And so to your point about from a policy and advocacy point of view specifically, um, we need to certainly take a life course approach to women's brain health. So we want to look at women and girls across the life course. So from adolescence to young adulthood to later life um, when we're looking at brain health. Um, and certainly from a policy point of view, um, what we um, want to do is advocate for policies that support young women's brain health and also dementia prevention, and also going back into schools as well, starting really early. So not just about physical health, but also learning about brain health. And we're great believers in filling in the knowledge gap. So it's presenting whether that's research findings, statistics, personal stories to really highlight the issue. Um, what I'd also like to flag is the importance of different agendas. So this is not just a brain health agenda, it's also a brain education agenda, a brain employment agenda. So they're different policy agendas. So whether that is health indeed, but it's also social care, um, it's research, innovation, technology, um, it's an economic issue. And certainly when we look more from um, a women's, a young women's brain health perspective, it's very much education, employment, gender equality. Um, and I think it would be great to have, whether that's at national, regional or global level, ideally, really strong advocacy campaigns talking about young women's brain health. Um, and raising that on the policy agenda. As some of you may know, um, the WHO recently has done some stellar work in terms of brain health. And um, we have the Intersectoral um, Global Action Plan on epilepsy and other neurological um, disorders. And this was adopted by the World Health Assembly um, last year, and now it's in implementation mode. This is an ideal time in implementation mode at both regional and national level to think about how to gain traction on this. We have also recently the WHO's um, position paper on optimizing brain health across the life course. And we have other initiatives um, at EU and national level. I think certainly at national level, we want to look at whether that's specifically national dementia plans, but more broadly, um, brain health um, strategies, to what extent are they talking about um, young women's brain health? And also, obviously, from a women's brain project perspective, having that gender perspective and that, uh, in general, women are disproportionately affected by brain um, conditions, whether that's, for instance, as I flagged earlier, when you look at, um, say, migraine, um, depression, um, there are high rates of incidence among females as opposed to males, and these have direct correlations later on in life um, with dementia. So it's having awareness um, and really, you know, it's it's never too early to, to raise awareness of, of these issues. And also, we're great believers at Women's Brain Project that knowledge is power. So women themselves are really educated and informed about brain health. Terrific. Wonderful. This is um, so thank you so much. If there's any questions for Anna Day or the Women's Brain Project, please put them in the chat. I'm now going to pass it back to Francesca, who will lead the panel discussion. So any questions, please uh, make us aware of them and we will we'll get to them. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you to our panelists. Who it's a lot. A lot was said there. Um, and we have less than 30 minutes left in this webinar. So we're gonna we're gonna get right in there. Um, I want to touch on something that I think Anna, you you already saw in the chat. So maybe you wanna speak to this question and anybody else. So Elizabeth had put in, 
can you say something about contraception, hormonal therapies, and brain health, please? I think that's what you were referring to, right? Yeah, so, so I did yeah. notice that question, and um, do bear with me, because I'm the political scientist in the team. I'm not the neuroscientist in the Women's Brain Project team. So certainly we do know in terms of um, if Elizabeth is getting to specifically dementia. I'm not sure if it's dementia-specific or brain health in general, but we do know hormones are a huge issue in terms of risk factor um, potentially later on in life um, for dementia. So when we look at early menopause, this type of thing, also um, the role of HRT, this is something that we're also further exploring, um, whether that is helpful um, as regards um, dementia prevention. Um, as regards contraception, I don't necessarily have the answer to that one, but um, as part of the sort of hormonal story, indeed, it's something that I know scientists in our team at Women's Brain Project are looking into all these issues. And we can certainly come back to you with a more detailed um, and scientific answer because uh, I'm here as the policy person, so I can't really give you a scientific answer, but certainly just broadly my understanding is definitely there is a strong hormonal reason why women tend to be more disproportionately affected by a whole raft of brain conditions, um, including um, Alzheimer's disease. That's brilliant, Anna. Sorry to put you on the spot. That's <laughs> about <all right>. the science. <laughs> Maybe I could just add something very briefly on that, because as part of the next gen project, we these are things that we've been thinking about and we just completed a scoping review on hormonal contraceptive use in young young adults, so young women um, and young trans women. Not surprisingly, not a lot of evidence in that age group, but when you think about the number of people in this age group who are taking hormonal contraceptives for 10, 15 years, so there, there's evidence that hormonal contraceptives do influence brain structure and brain function. What that means, we don't know. And then on the other end, hormonal replacement therapy, mixed evidence, some evidence to suggest it could be beneficial in terms of dementia risk. But I think the issue is that a lot of this is observational studies. So there has not been, say, a randomized control trial to look at that. So it's it's associational at the moment. So mixed evidence. But I think to Anna's point, just a lot more is needed. A lot more focus on this area is needed. Yeah. And like a lot of issues we have at Women's Brain Project, there are more questions than we have answers. Yeah. So one of the other areas that also is very much pertinent from a young woman's brain health point of view is long COVID. So as you may know, long COVID impacts women more than men, and in particular, and quite a significant numbers of young women. And that also has huge cognitive um, implications, and whether that's brain fog, um, depression, anxiety, and so on. So we're also looking into this um, at um, Women's Brain Project, but indeed to your point, um, um, Francesca, whether it's um, HRT or contraception, we're at the point where there's so many questions, but we don't necessarily have all the answers. And a lot of that comes back to my point earlier that we need the data, it's filling in those knowledge gaps. It's really mm -hmm. important. And that's also important when you go to policymakers as well. They want to see, they want to see data, they want to see evidence generation as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, another question in the chat we have from Helen. Helen, thank you for joining us. It's lovely to see you. Helen is asking, given the current state of violence and wars erupting in the world, how can we address the long-term effect of severe trauma on long-term brain health? Anyone in the panel? I mean, one thing I'm I'm thinking of, Maritza, not to call you out, but just um, I know that in the work that we've been doing in Peru, you had said you came back to me and Laura about our survey, and you said we need to be asking about violence because this is this is a problem in the community. So I don't know if you want to speak just a little bit to that, and then anyone else in the panel who would like to jump in would be. That'd be great. Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. Yes, violence could be a general issue, problem in our communities. Many times they are like, um, they are not able to talk about, they are um, a, a scared about to talk uh, violence. 
um, uh, into the community, into the family, but also in these two last year, Peru, as many of you maybe know, we are uh, facing really hard times in terms of um, biggest times of violence uh, and more focus in rural and indigenous communities uh, for many kind of political and economical reasons. So the more affected uh, community for that uh, in problems in our country, many times are our rural and, and communities and indigenous communities. So that is the reason why it is important to address this this kind of uh, issue. Absolutely, thank you, Maritza. Does anyone else on the panel wanna wanna weigh in on that? Any additional thoughts? No, <laughs> it's a big one. It's too it's too big a question for us to tackle in in the time we have. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, well, I guess it's a question, Magda, I'm gonna call it a question. So Magda says, I wonder if there is an opportunity in using this platform to also expand the conversation to include gender and sexual minorities, especially from a standpoint of risk reduction for adverse brain health across the life course. I guess to me, when I read this, I thought a little bit about what you had said earlier, Michaela, about sort of involving people from from the beginning. And when in the work that we do, you know, we we try to include groups from the beginning before the research is is designed so that people can feel, I guess, that there's a trust there in the relationship building, because sometimes groups that have been minoritized, you know, are they they have that people have that tokenistic view. So, oh, we need to bring you in um, so that we can see that we're engaging with these groups. But oftentimes groups have legitimate reasons for not wanting to trust researchers historically. So I don't know if you can speak a little bit around this issue in general. Yes, for sure. So um, it can be a difficult thing when you're working on a funded projects timeline, which tends to not always match with the timeline of uh, a human being. Um, and something that we encounter a lot is the struggle between our the time we have to conduct the research and our preferred, you know, publication uh, months, dates, and recognizing that sometimes with certain groups, it can take, years uh, to build the type of trust that you need to be able to have the conversations that you need to have. So um, I'm in, in Canada, there's a real push um, from our federally funded um, research bodies, which is wonderful to include extra funding and to earmark funding specifically for people with lived experience to be able to participate in a way that does not inconvenience them. Uh, you know, so you're able to provide childcare if needed, you're able to cover transportation costs, um, as well as a growing recognition of the time that it takes to build in those relationships, especially with folks who have been, um, marginalized and and treated horrifically by research in the past. So um, it's the first step is is recognizing that and then uh, coming at it from a place um, of having a lot of humbleness, uh, you know, and, and approaching it from there. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I think just being humble and, and to go back to what you said earlier as well, just being open to if the research needs to change completely. I know that's not always possible, but, you know, some being open to somebody coming in and saying, this isn't relevant to me, this isn't important, we need to totally focus on something else. Um, and I think we're getting better at that in research, but still, still little ways to go. Simon, uh, did you see Dana's question in the chat? I'm not sure if you've seen it, um, but it links back to something that you said. So Dana says her question stems from your remarks capturing the decreasing rates of dementia in wealthy nations. Older people from these places lived through trauma and violence of World War II during their young adult years. And as an Armenian American, Dana sees a direct line between lifelong brain health and trauma. And with that in mind, what are your thoughts on how we might collectively include the violence of war 
and forced displacement into more brain health campaigns. The best thing I have to say is that, the, you know, just from a sort of data point of view, it's a terribly difficult question to answer, right? Absolutely. That, that, that people who lived through uh, World War II are now at their youngest in their 80s. Um, there hasn't been a generation before where that was a common age. Life expectancy has increased so much. So we we so we, we just don't know. My second thought on that is that the brain health implications of living through a war or, or trauma like that go so far beyond specifically dementia that we've been talking about. I mean, we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. We're talking about lifelong depression. We're talking about all, all sorts of terrible problems. Um, and, and yes, Dana's absolutely right that clearly uh, the psychological trauma, the psychological implications of uh, people who have to live through warfare um, in so many places now in the world, clearly that, that needs to be taken into account. But um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what concrete to suggest there. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I think one thing I'm thinking of on this is, is um, and linking back to what you said earlier, so I work a lot in fear, I guess, and, and I generally think that, you know, fear can be a bit of a barrier when it comes to dementia and can stigmatize and, you know, lead to discrimination in these things. And I was just interested about what you were saying about brain health is a you know such a positive concept to have these campaigns around but fear can be very convincing uh, as a campaign and I guess this is kind of linking to to what Dana is saying as well you know I think how do we as a community promote brain health and move away from the the model of dementia is something that we should be so scared of that we can't talk about or these things are things that are so scary and so terrible that we can't have the conversation. Is that making sense? Yes, it does. And, and also that that to think of um, dementia, cognitive health as a kind of binary just clearly, yes. clearly makes no sense. That, that uh, I mean, a, a degree of cognitive impairment is going to come to us all. The, the, the question is, is uh, how, how do we live with it? How do we adapt to it? And at what point does it become a pathology that 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 that, that needs treatment. Um, so so yeah yeah absolutely. And and in terms of uh, of how we look after people who have been through conflict, trauma, um, I, I guess I guess I guess we're we're still learning, but we don't really know. Mm -hmm. We see another question in the chat from Helen. How do we allay fears? Are there any studies that specifically include? populations for long-term monitoring healthy brain aging study for next gen i mean that if only we had the money helen that's what Laura and i are trying to do here that's the barrier to these things is that there's such a, a long lead in time that you would need to monitor people and keep tracking them um we would we would love to do that laura i don't know if you want to jump in here with with any ad additional thoughts but i think this is one of the challenges that um we we have limited research funding. So how do we as a community keep studies going and keep people engaged over, over long periods of time? Mm -hmm. I think just to add that we have been incredibly creative and resourceful mm -hmm. with the limited funding that we have. Um, we have used every bit of grant money we have to be able to invest back into this project without actually receiving a massive grant yet. We have a number of grants in the pipeline, but it, that's exactly it, Helen. It's such a good question, but it's it's based on the resources, but we're working on that and finding creative ways so resources can stop being the barrier to getting this data. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it's also something that's also been said about it's not just brain health, it's kind of heart health and it's policy. And so linking in with existing projects that maybe don't focus on brain health necessarily, but have a different focus, but that are equally relevant to brain health, because what we've been seeing in our studies with with younger people, it's all brain health. You know, you kind of can't really separate it. So maybe that's another avenue that, you know, cross sectoral um, collaboration with and and um, reaching into existing studies that maybe yet yeah, don't have a focus on brain health yet but have potential to. How are we doing on time? I just want to be cognizant. Are we 
ready to move. We're ready to move. Thank you, Camelia. <laughs> she keeps us honest. So I am going to share our slides again, and I'm going to thank our panelists at the same time for the discussion. I know we had a lot of lofty concepts, so we appreciate they were not easy questions to tackle. Laura. All right, um, back to me again. Massive thank you to the panelists and everybody in the audience who engaged in questions and, and conversation there. This is not the this is not the end of this conversation. If you scan that QR code there, um, what you'll see is an is a survey. So we've worked very hard. Francesca has led this portion of the project to develop a survey that takes under 10 minutes to get an understanding of what are the attitudes and co comprehensions of young adults for their own brain health. Now, the survey isn't based on just us deciding what's in the Lancet Commission. This survey is based on lived experience experts engagement in Africa, Europe, and North America over the past two years. We've conducted focus groups with individuals who are both living at higher risk of dementia and earlier in life. So individuals living with obesity, individuals who play contact sports, young adults who, who vape or actively engage in illicit substance use. And from all of this knowledge, we've developed this survey now, we believe that there's strength in numbers. So our one request to everyone on this call, and come back to me, come back to me if you're on your phone or if you're on a different screen right now, we have one request for collaboration. We're asking anyone on this call who knows young adults, who is a young adult, who's a young adult who represents a population who maybe is underrepresented, underserved in research or health outcomes, please consider collaborating with us to get this survey out there. Again, we're doing this with very limited funding. So we've worked very hard to get good collaborations. If you're interested in working with us to get this survey out, our friend Camelia will be dropping our email address in the chat right there. You can just send us a brief line. We'll set up a meeting with you and discuss how possibly you can collaborate and we can work together on this. It's part of the global brain health community and we'd love for everyone to be involved if at all possible. Next slide, please, Francesca, after my little business pitch. Now, we also have one more thing, which isn't the survey. Um, at Alzheimer's Association's International Conference in Amsterdam in July, we had the privilege of running a consensus workshop with over 30 individuals representing over 15 countries and five continents. At this, we discussed what are the important issues for brain health in young adults, and are currently developing this into a publication to look at a roadmap for where researchers can include issues related and pertinent to young adults' brain health. I think that might be my last slide, or I believe I have one more slide, Francesca, if I may. And of course, we'd be remiss not to acknowledge Chuck Feeney. It's because of his legacy that we're all here together and we're able to have the discussion. So because of Chuck's generosity, he was able to donate a total of $8 billion over 38 years across five continents to his philanthropic work. We'd just like to recognize that for one second here, and we're very grateful for this as well. We'd like to thank the organizers, the speakers, and the audience members, and now we will hand it over to Professor Lawler to do the final wrap-up. Great, Laura. Thanks so much. I mean, I'm going to try and provide some reflections, but I mean, there's been such a rich discussion here, it's going to be very hard to summarize everything. But I, I think there were two things that struck out, st stuck out stuck out for me was one was about the importance of awareness. And the other was about brain health is not just the absence of disease or the absence of dementia, or about just uh, dementia risk reduction, it's much broader than that, particularly for this next generation. So Francesca told us about the um, the fact that you know exposure to risk occurs long before you develop a problem and there is a huge lack of awareness um among the general population particularly among young adults about risk and risks of, of you know uh, such as alcohol uh, concussion traumatic brain injury hypertension uh, we heard about trauma interpersonal violence all of these issues which contribute to uh, poor brain health uh, and have long exposures before people develop problems, not necessarily dementia, problems with depression, PTSD, and so on. These are all impact on our brain health. So there's very much a lack of awareness uh, about that. 
And Maritza, you know, speaking about her work in Peru, particularly with the indigenous, you know, that, that tells us that brain health of this next generation, it's not just a, a problem in, in, in the global north. This is a, uh, a problem for the majority world. And uh, it's a global issue. And again, in, in her context uh, and, and where she works, there seems to be, a, again, a lack of awareness, a lack of knowledge. And again, how important it is for the type of research that she's conducting there to, to generate knowledge and understanding about brain health um, in, 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 in Peru and uh, in low and middle income countries. Again, an issue around lack of awareness. Um, Michaela talked about the, the importance of lived experience and co-creation, co-production uh, uh, for, for research. And, uh, and I, I, this is true for all aspects of brain health, but particularly for next generation brain health. And one of the things that struck me from what she was saying was how I think the messaging, you know, in terms of raising awareness uh, around the importance of brain health uh, for next generation, how we need to think about how that message uh, is developed and transmitted and delivered. And again, we, we very much need those, pe those people with the lived experience from this next generation to develop that message so that we can actually increase awareness in the right way for this next generation. Now, Simon talked about the, the fear of dementia, the stigma of dementia, and I guess the difficulty it can be, it can, can, that there is to talk about dementia. It's easier to talk about brain health. And I think that he emphasized, and I agree with this, you know, the, the, the positive value of brain health, how accessible, how acceptable it is to talk about brain health for this next uh, generation. And, and I really love the idea of reframing dementia from the perspective of brain health, how positive that is, and how this is probably the way forward in terms of raising awareness in young adults about the risks to brain health across the life course. Now, Anna, again, raised the question of, of, of awareness, the importance of awareness. I mean, coming from the, uh, the Women's Brain uh, Project and the Women's Brain Perspective, um, and how we need to create greater awareness about the particular risks and threats uh, to, to, to uh, women's brain health. Um, and how we need to raise awareness about this risk uh, in young adulthood. And I, and I guess what was also mentioned was not just about raising awareness um, in, in, in people themselves, uh, in young adults, but also raising awareness um, uh, with the policymakers, uh, uh, if we really are going to be able to affect change. So, I mean, I think it was an extraordinarily interesting uh, and stimulating uh, webinar. I think there's a lot that we know about brain health and next generation, but we have an awful lot to learn. And I guess this is why we need the survey. We need people to participate. <clears throat> so um, bang that drum, uh, spread the word, um, and we need to keep beating this drum to raise awareness about the importance of next generation brain health. I, I think we're at the very start uh, of, of, of something really, really important here, uh, this next generation brain health. I think it's going to be a, a wonderful movement, and I think it's going to do a lot in terms of improving brain health and, and creating a kind of the next generation uh, brain health. So thank you once again to, to Laura and Francesca for, for developing the concept. And, and thanks to um, everybody uh, in the back room who really made this uh, webinar such a success. I'll just hand back maybe to Francesca or Laura, do you want to say a, a parting word? Our parting word is we're handing to Camellia. <laughs> okay, back to Camelia, Thank you, Brian. the CEO, Thank you. CEO of this operation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And as Brian was saying, we do want to just bang that drum, get this movement, get this word out. And so with that, on behalf of our entire GBHI team across our two sites and the senior fellows, fellows who are global, we want to say thank you to Francesca and Laura for leading this session and to all of you for the efforts you're going to take afterwards. And again, one more round of applause to Laura, Francesca, and all of the speakers. We truly appreciate you being here. Please do be in touch again with the email address and the link, and we look forward to collaborating together. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to Winnie, who is our technology lead, helping us out so much today. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.